Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first Cardio Land Morning Action Network monthly meeting. We'd like to thank all of you for taking the time out of your schedule to join us today. We really hope that you'll find this, what we like to call a work group or this LAN, uh, beneficial not only just to receive information, but also we'd like it to develop into more of a working environment where everyone can continue to share and take in knowledge, but also share your experiences and your own knowledge to try to advance the cardiovascular practices in home health setting. We want to just say a couple of housekeeping items. This call is being recorded for those who weren't able to make it on today's call. And all the lines currently are muted, but you can unmute yourself. And we want to encourage you to participate and ask questions as well as send in uh, questions to the chat box. So we'll go ahead and get started and just to let you know about this cardio land. So it, like I said, it is a learning action network. And you can see on the four squares here that we're talking about the sharing of cardiovascular knowledge and also the application of resources. And this is not just a one-way street. This is not about HHQI. This is really about those of you that are in the agencies, those of you really doing the work and you're in the homes, you're petting the patient's dog, you're trying not to step on their iguana or the gerbil, and you know, you're trying to keep the cat out of your sterile field. Those, this is what this work group is for. There are many work groups around the country looking at improving cardiovascular care, not only in the home, but for all of our patients in this country. But most of those work groups are at more of a national or state level, or maybe even county or community level. What we wanted for this work group is for those actually in the home taking care of patients to have a work group where you can share with each other and share with us and we'll share with you so that we can all try to see what is working and what we can do to improve it. So in another square of that four corner square, you'll see networking. And that's another thing we'd like, we hope that you'll be able to take out of this session is so that you can learn to, not learn, but uh, that you can learn from each other is what I was meaning for networking. And as we've talked about, you'll have direct access to the HHQI team. We're going to be hosting this call every time, but again, it's not about us. It is about you. And we want to try to identify areas of where home health can really make an impact on cardiovascular care. We have a very unique opportunity because of the nature of the home health setting. And that's something that we want to really expand upon and take advantage of it because it is what it is, and it would be fantastic if we can make some level of improvement at a community level across the board. Now on the next slide, we'll talk about the cardio milestones. I'm not going to read this to you. I just want to mention that these are the milestones, as you can see, by joining this land, you have already, you've already met milestone one. There are five milestones, and as you achieve the milestones, you and your agency will receive distinct logos, and certificates. Now, those will come out about the second week of the following month. So everybody is on the cardio land now. You've met milestone one. You'll receive a logo that you can use either electronic or in any other type of publicity that you'd like, as well as a certificate. And those will come to you, like I said, around the second week of the following month. So around the December 14th, 12th, somewhere in that area, you'll be receiving this information. Now the next slide is talking about cardiovascular highlights and coming along towards the end of the call will be Stacey Deslick and she'll talk about that. This is kind of an orientation to how the cardio land work group is going to be structured. We're going to talk a little bit about what's going on with HHQI and cardiac around the country. Then we're going to cover a little bit of the cardiovascular highlights, talk about that to kind of bring it all around. And then we'll move into the next slide where you'll see Home Health Cardiovascular Data Registry. And this is about the point in the slide, or in the, uh, I don't want to call it a meeting, but that's kind of what we're at right now is a meeting. This will be where we'll have a few, maybe 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes of content on different topics. Now the topics we've gathered so far are going to be topics that we've heard from you over the past nine months to a year of content that you'd like to hear or learn more about. We'll cover, um, 
disparities in care when it comes to cardiovascular, race, ethnicity, male versus female, age groups, is there a payment source issue? So we'll have experts talking on each of those. We'll also have uh, content experts discussing maybe are you using one of your best resources, your staff, your clinicians, your therapists, your home health aides, to their max potential in order to prevent or to improve the cardiovascular care of your patients? We'll have experts on, on speaking to that. We'll also um, look at the different resources that are available through nutrition therapy and um, as well as the different tools and resources that are available through HHQI. Because the registry just launched last weekend, just like four or five days ago, we thought we'd start by this particular meeting, our initial or our inaugural meeting. We'll go ahead and start that as a kickoff and talk about the registry. But hear this, though. <laughs> you do not need to be abstracting in the registry to participate in this cardio LAN. This is a LAN that does focus on home health agencies and home health care and the improvement of cardiovascular care. But everyone is welcome to join. So don't let the fact if you're not abstracting or you don't want to abstract, that has nothing to do whether you can participate in this LAN. Because though the LAN does focus more towards that, we will touch on it from time to time about the registry as keeping it up to date of what's going on. Now one other topic that I did want to throw out there so that kind of to squelch any questions because we have heard this topic over and over being requested is that another topic we will cover on this LAN are looking at the CMS reporting home health agency data sources, Home Health Compare, CASPER, and the HHQI data reports, also HCAPS. How do all of these impact cardiovascular care? So we'll go ahead and get started on today's topic and we'll talk about the data registry itself. And just a few HHCDR facts or Home Health Cardiovascular Data Registry. So the facts are, there, and I will just mention that there is a webinar recorded called HHCDR Overview found under the data resources. And some of you may have already viewed that, so we're not going to cover it word for word in that, but just a few of the highlights here. So let's talk about the who. When we're talking about the registry itself, remember the registry is created for measurement of the cardiovascular preventive measures. So when we're talking about who, we're talking about patients who have been discharged from your agency, who were cared for by your agency for greater than 14 days. The rationale behind that is that we felt that if you had, if there is a patient that's under your care for less than 14 days, your priorities are probably not going to be preventative cardiovascular care. They're going to be for whatever you were in the home for anyway. But if they are there longer than that, that does leave ample opportunity to touch on preventative cardiovascular care. Um, the WHO also includes the individuals who meet the age requirements for each of the measures. Now, when we're talking about measures, we're talking about the ABCS, which we'll talk about in a minute. Most of those are for 18 and older, but there are specific age ranges for each of the measures. And I'm only saying this so that if you have a patient and you're wondering why they're not in the registry, you can look to see if they met the qualifications for that particular aspirin, blood pressure, cholesterol, or smoking measure. Now with these measures of ABCS, as most of you probably know, when you select them, you will have 12 patients per measure. And that's an approximate number. You may have a couple more, you may have a couple less, unless you only select one measure. If you select either A or B, so it's either aspirin or blood pressure or cholesterol or smoking, you will have exactly 12 patients. And I need to correct myself there because I've been saying this from the beginning. These are not patients, these are episodes of care. <laughs> so forgive me in the past and present and forgive me for my future in saying that because I'm sure I'm gonna to continue to mix it up. But do understand that if you do have a patient who bounced in and out of your agency and was discharged by your agency twice in one month, they may very well show in the registry on two different occasions as two different episodes. Now back to the numbers. So 12 patients per ABCS. If you select more than one, a patient may qualify for two different measures, but this is a random selection. 
So with the random selection, if the patients do qualify for two and they were randomly selected for both of those measures as to be one of the 12 episodes to count for that, then your numbers will be less. If they don't, you will have a maximum number of 12 per measure. So if you select all four measures, maximum number you will have are 48 episodes of care. See, I'm doing better. I didn't say patients. <laughs> the randomization is done by the computer program. We don't have control over it, neither do you. So once you open your registry, you'll, go, you'll see immediately your pre-populated your pre patients. Those are the ones that must be abstracted in order to have a valid report. Now, when we say valid report, I mean uh, it adds validity to your report. What it removes is the hunting and pecking, as I like to call it, of selecting patients of which ones you're going to choose. So if you open a patient's record and, oh, this patient was not a good patient to do this. No, no, we don't want to abstract on that patient. Well, that will weaken your report. By completing the patients that are pre-populated right there as soon as you open your screen, that takes the selection process or the hunting and pecking out of the picture. And so that, that adds strength to your report, which is what you'll want. So those patients are on there. And then after the initial episode is complete, the registry will populate with all the episodes. And what that means is that once you complete your last patient that was a required patient, you'll close that patient Go back, it'll take you automatically back to the main screen where you thought, whew, I'm done, that's it, I'm done for the month. And then all of a sudden, if your agency had more than, let's say you chose one up one measure, let's say you chose blood pressure, you complete your 12 patients for blood pressure and you finish that final patient, then all of a sudden, it takes you back to the main screen, which is normal. You've been going back to the main screen after every patient, but this time, when you think you're finished, you see 50 more patients. Don't worry, you don't have to do those patients. What we did though, is the more data you collect, that will add strength to your report. So you're welcome to continue abstracting, but you only need to do those first 12 patients. Now we've already heard some concerns, so what we're working on is putting up some sort of little warning, warning screen saying that you're gonna go back and you're gonna see more patients, but don't worry, you don't need to do these if you don't want to, something along those lines. You can tell, I'm a nurse, I'm not a data person. But the programmers will fix out some nice language and you'll start to see that. But in the meantime, if you are abstracting, you will see that and, I, and it does cause concern and we don't want that to happen. Okay, so that's the who. Let's talk about the when. The patients, ah, see, I said it again. The episodes of care will be populated in the registry on the 15th of every month. That's why it started this past weekend. And yes, we know it was a weekend, but we wanted to keep it on the 15th of every month. You can open that registry and you will find your patients ready to go. Now, all agencies who close their months, once you have finished your required number of patients, if you close that by the 14th of the following month, we'll pull that data. Closing your month, closing your patients, that allows, that triggers it to us that we can pull them on the 14th of the following month. We'll pull that information and create the data reports that will be posted with all of your other HHQI data reports around the 23rd of the month. So once you close it, and it's, it doesn't matter if you close it on the 17th of the month, we won't pull the data until the 14th of the following month. So let's use some dates here. It opened on November 15th. We'll close it, or excuse me, there's no we to it. You will close it. Close your months by the 14th of December, and we will pull that data, and by around the December 23rd area, you'll have reports waiting for you. And these will be your HHCDR reports, but you'll also receive the reports of your normal HHQI data reports, if you're familiar with it. Now let's talk about the what, the where, and the how. Let's start with a plot, talking about the ABCS. When we're talking about the ABCS data, and I realize that many of you um, may already be aware of this, but we do want to make sure that we're starting this work group all on the right page, we're all kind of together on this. Let's talk about some of the data elements that you'll be asked about. So if you go into the registry and you select, I want to just focus in on aspirin as appropriate. The question you'll be asked 
is, was the patient taking aspirin or other antithrombotic? That's it. Now, I guess I should back up. Every patient in the registry, it does not matter what measure you select, every patient will be asked, did the patient have both Medicare and Medicaid? It's a yes or no question. But other than that one standard question that goes on every single patient, aspirin, you have one question. If you choose blood pressure, you would be asked, what was the patient's final blood pressure? And was hypertension addressed? Blood pressure will be asked on patients who have a diagnosis, and this is the ICD-9 code being transmitted on your OASIS. If they have an ICD-9 code on the OASIS that indicates the patient had hypertension, they will fall into this hypertension category. If they have an ischemic vascular disease, or IVD, which covers heart attacks, strokes, peripheral artery disease, multiple, multiple other diagnoses, they will qualify for the aspirin and the cholesterol measure. And smoking is every single patient qualifies for that because that's actually a tobacco screening. So let's continue on with the ABCS. C is for cholesterol. Did the patient have a lipid screening in the past year? It's a yes or no question. And if so, what was the value of the LDLC? That's it. Now, if you chose smoking, or like I said, tobacco is what it really is, is a tobacco screening. You'll be asked, was the patient screened for tobacco use? Remember, this is not the OASIS question, because the OASIS question is looking over the past 12 months. This is current usage. Was the patient screened for tobacco use? And if they were found to be a tobacco abuser, was tobacco cessation counseling or pharmaco um, medications, were medications altered and prescribed to help the patient curb the tobacco craving? It's yes or no, and that's it. So if you select all four of these measures to focus, you will have approximately 48 episodes of care that will need to be completed, and these are the questions you'll be asked. If I was in an agency starting this new, I would probably be a little timid and want to go with one or two measures just to get my feet wet the first two months, or first month. With that in mind, you'll probably want to select blood pressure and smoking. And the only reason I say that is because those are the two measures that impact the quality of health that all patients experience, not just cardiovascular patients. So let's say this will, we want this to align with what you're already doing in the agency and with your current work. So if you're focusing on wound management, wound care, then Smoking is tobacco use because of the detriment that tobacco can cause to healing wounds. Focusing on tobacco, you'll kind of kill two birds with one stone. It will be aligning with your current efforts, but also then you're participating in the cardiovascular registry. Same thing with blood pressure. Patient has hypertension, especially if they have any type of renal disease, liver disease. These are, um, again, these are issues that affect the entire body. All right, so that's the what. Now let's talk about the where. Most of you are probably familiar with this, but if you're not, once you log into the data access, that's the same place that you currently receive all of your HHQI data reports. If you click on the brown toolbar going across the top, you'll see where that little circle is, where it says HHCDR. That's where you'll click in order to get to the registry. You click that, it will take you right in. To get the report that's going to be published, you'll use the drop-down menu where the arrow is pointing to get report. And you'll see there's a little drop-down menu, and you can select any report that you want. All right, let's talk about the how. The how, this is a big one. This is, it's important. You guys hold all of the power here. As an agency, you select which measure, the ABCS, that you want to abstract. This is a once a month option. Select it one time. The following month, you'll get the exact same question. So let's say we go back to our scenario, and you know, a little timid the first month. I know I would be. I might just select blood pressure. Or again, if I was looking at wounds, I'd probably go with smoking. All right, I do that the first month, and I do my 12 patients. And it turns out, you know, 
wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. In fact, it was pretty easy. The next month, you're asked the same question. Which selections would you like to review? I might go for a second option then, maybe smoking and add in blood pressure, or maybe I want to go with aspirin. Whatever you want to focus, and this aligns with your current process, it's your choice. But again, you get the choice once a month, and then once it's locked in, it's locked in. But the following month, you can change your mind. All right, so that's the who, what, and where, and how. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about resources. And the first thing on the resources is the HHCDR chart abstraction tool. Just wanted to take a second and point this out because um, we've already talked to some agencies who are abstracting and they didn't know that this existed. So we just want to make sure that if you are participating in the registry that you do you are aware of this tool. It's in electronic format. It's in electronic format and you can print it or you can use it electronic or you can embed it in your EHR. You'll notice that all of the questions are there, and what many agencies do is they go ahead and use this and have the nurses who are discharging or the clinicians who are discharging the patient to go ahead and complete this So at the time of discharge. The patients will not show up in the registry for probably about six weeks after discharge. So once they do this, you can store it, and wherever you store your normal, wherever you store your normal uh, patient chart information, and then once the patients are in the registry, you can pull that paper and you're good to go. All right, well with that, um, I think I'll turn this over, if it's okay, with uh, Misty Kevich, and she'll talk more about the HHQI cardiovascular resources. Misty? Thanks very much, Cindy, and welcome everyone to the webinar today. Again, we're trying to give you an introduction of uh, of how to use the tool, why to, to, to be part of the registry that Cindy's covered in those what and how uh, questions and, and thinking about it. But we have lots of re resources for you to help you because the data is essential for you to do any type of quality improvement. You know that with acute care hospitalizations, improving uh, oral medication management, um, any fall activities, you're collecting data and you're using the data to identify a problem. So this is going, you're starting data, if you're starting this month, um, getting started, you're going to have some great baseline data. Then you're going to think about what intervention strategies that you're going to use to create a quality plan. And you're not going to have to do the investigating and finding resources. There's no sense in reinventing the wheel. If we can do that work for you, put it into your hands for you to pick and choose what's going to work best for your organization, your patient population. And again, you want to use small intervention strategies and continue to build and spread those. You don't, that's the most effective way in doing quality improvement. And with that being said, we're going to talk about some of the cardiovascular resources. I'm going to kind of throw in off my little soapbox that I tend to get on a lot, that they tie into the proposed conditions of participation is huge. Um, I know most of you have already read that. Uh, we are now going to be re required or at least proposed to be required to create two quality plans, a quality improvement plans, one for a, something of your choice, which can be cardiovascular, so you can be working on improving hypertension um, at your organization, that would be an excellent goal, and the other would be on an infection control plan. Those are two of the pieces. The, if the COP is a high, it's full of quality patient-centeredness, and this is a great opportunity to utilize this information um, and utilize this project. You're collecting data in a registry that's the first time for home health to be able to participate in, in a data registry where hospitals and physician offices um, are constantly using data registries all the time to collect data, make improvements, standardize evidence-based practices, and this is a great uh, cardiovascular health is great because this is what the physicians are working on as well. They had publicly reported data. So we have like work, gives us great collaboration opportunities, as well as it does increase your, you know, your referrals as a secondary gain because you're, you're able to help 
with uh, working with those physicians who are in very busy practices in helping to meet their outcomes, but ultimately it is the patient's outcomes. So the first resource, uh, we do have a polling question up, so you're welcome to answer the polling question of what data sources do you currently use to evaluate your QI process. But we did create last year two cardiovascular health BPIPs, or best practice intervention packages. We used acronyms a lot, just like CMS and, and most everywhere that you work. So these two BPIPs, the first was related to aspirin is appropriate, the second was blood pressure control. The second, the second part two was cholesterol management and smoking cessation. And they were posted last year in August and November. Well, lo and behold, because that's just kind of how things work, the end of November and beginning of uh, December, new guidelines came out related to cholesterol and to hypertension. Um, there's a lot of controversy over those. There's still some controversy, but it's really starting to die down, but we did create or, um, earlier this year, updates that went with each of those. A blood pressure update went with part one, and part two had a cholesterol management. Nothing was wrong in the packages or, or it's out of date. This would supplement it with the most current physician practice updates and some additional information. And so that's fine and good. But as we moved into kicking the data registry off, as we're in phase four, rather than having four documents to have to look at, we decided our first thing would be to do is to collapse that, to embed and to integrate that. So it's December the 1st. Um, we will be posting at Cardiovascular Health 1 and 2, or it's really a reposting of those. The cover will state, which you see in red here, shows that it includes the new guidelines, and then the updates are no longer necessary because we took the key information from the updates and embedded it where it belongs in the BPIP. So, you know, this works great. So. If you're sitting there saying, but I already downloaded it and I printed them off already, that's fine. You can use them. There is nothing wrong. There is nothing that has been taken out differently. But what we have done is tried to collapse the, the guidelines in there to make it easier for you. Personally, I like to keep an electric uh, copy always of the best practice packages to work from because there's so many hyperlinks and embedded to so many resources that I might want to take a look at. It's easy to do it that way. But a lot of times, it, it, some things are easier to read, it, you know, when it's printed, and that might be where you want to do highlighting and you might want to do some uh, sticky notes and, and ideas that how I'm going to spread this out over the next you know, a few months, the next six months, how am I going to constantly reinforce these principles? The other part of what we're going to be releasing December 1st is we have, we have mentioned on our other webinars for the phase four that we're going to be doing some Spanish translations of key pretty much patient resources because we've heard the need over and over. But this is such an important topic because we are trying to affect a million lives as part of a cross-setting approach to reduce a million heart attacks and strokes and to improve the cardiac um, risk factors for our patients and, and improve their quality of life, that for some leadership, quality folks, um, and maybe Spanish is their native language or they're more comfortable in reading. We felt that it was relevant to go ahead and have the full packages um, uh, in to gr it translated into Spanish. So the integrated two packages that will go up on the 1st of December will be both in English and Spanish. Now, that's an exception than just patients, but the patient tools that are included are also translated with one exception, and it, it's a very minor um, a tool with very few words. So. So that's what's coming with the cardiovascular resources. And next I want to show you just a couple tools. Um, each, the package is filled with lots of tools and resources. We, we have researched and looked, and if there wasn't something around that we thought was relevant, we created something. But we found lots of resources, but you can't implement all of those. It's overwhelming when you look at the amount of resources. What we're going to do is highlight on each of these calls. 
different resources and telling you about, hey, this is in here, this is a really great resource. And one of the things that we will be doing differently in phase four, or not differently, but adding more and more meat of how do I integrate that? How do I get buy-in? How, do, how does a nurse integrate that into their day-to-day -day activities? Because they're so busy, and then you ask them to do smoking cessation, you ask them to to start teaching on cholesterol management. We can't even get the cholesterol labs. How are we supposed to do that? So those are the things that we're gonna kind of help you, giving you some uh, ideas and, and, and a chance, because as Cindy said, this call typically will be 20 to 30 minutes of content, but then a lot of time to brainstorm or ask questions. You will also be asked um, an evaluation at the end of this session. So put some areas each time, oh, I really would like to see something on this, or it would be helpful if I knew more about whatever. So we do read all of those, we take those very seriously, and it also helps to plan our future education activities. So what we have here, are some examples. Um, we have three minute videos from uh, Mayo Clinic is the example here. We also have even like, I think it's a 36 second video that's in there that's great. Um, as well as American Heart Association has 15 different cardiac topics and there's slides. And so what you do is, is we really encourage clinicians. We know most of those or a large number of home health agencies now, their clinicians carry a laptop. They, a tablet, or even a smartphone. You can download most of these already onto your, ta onto your computer so that you don't necessarily have to have the internet connection. Um, and so what you can do is we educate primarily orally. We might give them a patient sheet to go along with it, but we do a lot of oral education. And is that the best way that we all learn? We learn best by hearing the information in different different methods. Um, that's part of the adult learning principles, is to continue to provide the education, do a teach back to find out what they know, what they don't know, and teach back is not a quiz to see what they learned, it's a quiz to see how well I did as an educator. I need to change it up. So we're, we do have a lot of multimedia tools that, hey, three minutes, I can sit down, turn my computer around with my patient, watch the video, talk about how a thrombus forms, talk about how your fats tie into creating um, creating cholesterol and how, what the cholesterol can do, and look at the damage it does to your heart and how the heart gets dark and we can see what's happening or where the clot goes to the brain. So it allows that patient to be engaged in, and, and trying to start that activation process. If they understand that, then let's tie it back to their meds and their med, um, their med compliance. Let's, let's we, you know, try to use some pictures to paint what really is going to happen and, and what kind of quality of life issues they may have. So there's some great examples and, and these work very well. Now the next slide I'm gonna show you is just some examples of what this video looks like. And I think if we click through this video, you're gonna see a sample. And I love these, I think they're great. So you can see where the clot is forming. You can, um, and watch as it's starting to build up and to reduce the blood flow and it's going to rupture off, goes to the heart. You can see the blackened area where the rupture is. So to this, to me, it works very well for a patient to physically see what happens. The nurse can read along on the side that she can use, he or she can use their own words to describe this. And this is something that could be used a couple times during an episode to really reinforce, let the patient teach back and tell you what's happening. Okay, on the next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about blood pressure. Cindy talked about that is probably one of the easier areas to start first because it, it really does tie nicely into what we do in home health. We check blood pressures, but the first question is, do we check those accurately? And the answer to that is probably not. We get, as clinicians, every one of us, and I'm included, we get very much targeted with uh, so much that was on our plate and what we're doing that a lot of things become routine and mundane and we don't think about the practice. 
Now, as quality leadership, and I'm sure many of you on this call have helped prep for surveys and you've gone out on field visits as supervisors, and how many, or how many times did the surveyor come back and said, everything went well with the visit, but you know what, your clinician listened to, to the heart and the lungs with, you know, over top of clothing, or they didn't remove the sleeve to have skin-to-skin -skin contact of the blood pressure. We know they happen, but how, so what are you going to do about that? And and will be demeaning for me to do a competency on blood pressure monitoring. Well, you think about it. You can't treat something if you're getting inaccurate uh, readings. Think about it just like Oasis. You know you you with Oasis and improving outcomes, you have to have consistent data. We have to be answering the questions accurately. And, and we have to constantly be re-educated on Oasis. Well, the same thing is true with blood pressure monitoring, even for nurses, even for therapists. And we found this through the pilot that a lot of therapists are not doing vital signs. And so my first questions to you as leadership and getting ready to, to embark into this uh, cardiac uh, data registry is, do, is our policy, look at it, is it for all clinicians to take blood pressures on every visit? We were surprised in doing chart reviews and then looking at the a pilot that how many therapists do not do um, blood pressure um, checks on each visit. And are they communicating it? Are they doing it right? There is evidence into how you do it with your feet on the ground, skin, uh, skin to stethoscope contact and uh, and how long you have to sit. So we do have a one page on accurate blood pressure monitoring. There is also a great video and you're seeing just a slide shot here on the left of it from um, the Journal of um from JAMA, I believe is where it's from. And it's linked within the packages uh, to, to help with that. We've also been, uh, and there's directions that should be using the bell or the or uh, the diaphragm. You use the bell for the blood pressure. And I can tell you, when we spoke at a conference uh, last month, somebody asked the question in, in the follow-up question, what about the length of the stethoscope? And I didn't know the answer to that. So I came back and looked in the BPEP, and it's like, well, it doesn't say anything about the length of the stethoscope. Because as they indicated, a lot of people like to put it over their neck, and, and so they like it longer. Other people think shorter is better. So I did some research after I got back. The length does not matter, but it is important that you're using the bell, and we do have that information included there. So doing competencies, and we're going to give you examples of using competency fairs. We, um, you can include that with your, you know, you're doing a wound checkup or your annual evaluations. You can do, do a competency. Also, it's important to get patients activated and involved because we can do everything till we're blue in our face, but the patients are going to make the difference and their family members. So there's a great resource on ambulatory blood pressure monitoring that's included in the package. There's a nice resource plus there's uh, some nice text about what it is. We're going to also be introducing some cool, some cool things of how to, to do that with like some create little cards to give out for Christmas time um, to have them or birthdays where family patients could ask their families to purchase a self monitoring uh, blood pressure for at home. Again, I've had this question just asked yesterday uh, when I spoke at another uh, state conference. But what, how about the accuracy? And it's the same as weights. When you're having a patient check their blood pressures, we should check it against um, uh, one of our blood pressures to see that it's within a line, it's not too far off. But the point is you're looking for trending. You're looking for that line, just like our scales. We're looking for trending, not so much that you really weigh 157 pounds, but you went up five pounds. So we have great resources on that. And the next resource or information that I want to share with you on the next slide, we're going to talk a lot about lifestyle modifications. We're going to be doing some video series for patients and for clinicians, little video BPIPs. We're going to really try to, to focus on these lifestyle changes such as diet, dash diet, increasing activity, decreasing uh, weight, stopping smoking. All of these things all help reduce the millimeters of mercury for a systolic pressure. And why is it important is because five millimeters of reduced blood, systolic blood pressure can reduce a 14% overall reduction in mortality to stroke, 9% related to um, mortality due to 
um, CHD, and 7% in all-cause mortality. So even a small 2 to 4% reduction, we have a great table that's included about lifestyle uh, modifications, and it shows what each of those categories, the average amount can it reduce. And five millimeters is significant, not only in saving lives, but cardiovascular health is expensive. And so we are also going to save Medicare dollars, Medicaid dollars, um, but most important, lives and quality of life. Now on the next slide, I'm going to just tell you a few things, and if you've been on our other webinars within the last month or two, then you know we've talked a little bit about the HHQI University, and we're getting closer to it becoming live. In January, we're going to have use a learning management system platform for you. For It's called HHQI University. So you as leaders, you at, can encourage and invite your clinicians to participate as well. Your clinicians, all they'll have to do is sign up, and you'll want to make sure they have their CCN number because you want to be able to get, we'll be able to look at studies to see, uh, inter, you know, with some of the data to look at, you know, the the people that are participating and, and how their how their results are doing, and you'll be able to um, see be able to see some of those statistics, uh, making an impact in your in your cardiovascular out, output as well. So they're going to be able to come on, or anybody will be able to come on, not just nursing, but we are going to start with free CEs for nursing that will be ANCC approved. That is accepted across all the states. Two states have some particulars about how many you can use in a year from um, outside their state programs, but you can use those. So we're going to be putting up every month a new activity. Most will have CEs for um, nursing, but not all will. Um, they're definitely appropriate for therapists. We, can't, we will continue to investigate doing CEs for therapy. For PTs, it's, it's virtually impossible at this point because there is no national accrediting body that we can do that with, but we've been working with the APTA on that. And OTs in speech, I can tell you for your national organization and a lot of the states, but each state is different, they're able to submit um, certificates of attendance um, from activities and uh, they're, you know, they're able to utilize these certificates as well. So anybody can come on, can take these educational sessions. So what we've tried to do is take some of that burden off of you too into providing that education. We're going to be able to do it in a very easy, icon-driven uh, format that they can go on. They'll do the content uh, for the first session. It's going to be the state of cardiovascular health. They're going to come on, they're going to listen to two podcasts, they're going to do a little bit of reading and look um, at a tool, and then they're going to take a post-test and an evaluation, and it will be a full hour's worth of continuing education. So very excited about that. Um, so that's where we're headed for next month. And I think that brings us to our questions. So Cindy, I'm going to turn it back to you to let you facilitate the Q&A. Well, thank you very much, Nancy, and I appreciate that. Um, before we go to Q&A, why don't we just take a quick minute and go to Stacey Deskwood, because her part of the call is going to be moving forward. will be something I think all of you will look forward to. I know it's something that we're looking forward to. So, Stacey, we'll turn it over to you for a quick minute or two. All righty. Thank you, Cindy. Um, can you all hear me okay? Sure can. Okay, great. Um, so moving forward, when we're doing these calls, we will have a little selection or a little section um, that we're going to call cardiovascular highlights or some catchy phrase like that. And basically, I will just kind of discuss how we're doing in the registry. Um, and once we get some data in there and produce some reports, we can talk a little bit about the data, sort of you know on an aggregate level, and let everybody know what kind of conclusions we can start to draw. Maybe pull in some. Um, comparison type things so that we can get an idea of how agencies are performing overall. Um, we may also highlight agencies who are doing outstanding in a certain measure, um, of course with agency approval. We're not going to call anybody out um, without giving you a heads up first. And so that will be kind of an exciting thing. And, and basically this just will, will help you all to get sort of in touch with the data and understand 
what it is that these reports are showing you, what the registry really is collecting and reporting on, and how you can use it to improve cardiovascular health. Um, we may also check in with the milestones that Cindy mentioned earlier and see, you know, who's reached what milestone. I would love for next month to be able to say, you know, that everybody is past milestone two and we're all working on milestone three, which is, you know, submitting data and um, downloading reports. That would be awesome to get to that point. So, um, especially next month. And um, we'll be able to kind of report on those different data-oriented um, data-oriented things. So right now we're waiting on the uh, data registry to close, and that won't happen until the 14th of next month. So you all have plenty of time to get out there and start abstracting. And then once it closes, as Cindy said, we'll go ahead and produce the reports, and they'll be available right around the 23rd of that month. So, but in the meantime, next month's call, we can certainly um, cover, you know, some of the stuff that we're seeing in the registry. And then moving forward, of course, data being what it is, as it piles up, it makes more and more sense and gives you a more clear picture of what's going on. So that is what you can look forward to um, in the cardiovascular highlights portion of our call. Cindy, that's all I have for that for this month, so I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Stacey, and we do appreciate that. And like I said, I hope you guys will enjoy this call because this meeting is for you, and we want to have this evolve into something that you will not only find useful, but hopefully through networking and sharing experiences, you'll find it beneficial to be on the, come to this meeting the third Thursday of every month at 2 o'clock. So with that being said, I will just go ahead and, Misty Dyke, uh, you're hosting. Do you have any questions that, you're, that you've been getting in? Yeah, Cindy, I have one question that's in the Q&A box um, from Mary Ann, and she'd like to know, do we need to obtain patient consent? Um, I'm assuming she's asking about HHDDR. That's a really good question, and Mary Ann, thank you very much. No, you do not need to receive, uh, obtain patient consent. I will give this, a, um, actually, Stacey, why don't I turn this question over to you, because you have the better language. I, I understand it, but Stacey is much better at explaining it. Thanks, Cindy. Um, okay, so you don't need to obtain patient consent. Um, as an agency that's contracted with CMS, we are bound to maintain patient confidentiality, and we are covered under the HIPAA uh, compliance order um, as a quality organization. So we have a whole host of different processes in place to maintain your patient confidentiality. Um, our website is secure using um, SSL. I, I'm, I'm going to go into a little IT discussion, so if I lose you, I apologize, because I didn't know anything about this until I asked. Um, but we do use secure layers. And then for data access, um, there's a separate login, and there are firewalls built, and we have a pretty up-to-date um, an impressive security system as far as our website and data entry goes. Um, additionally, we have other processes in place for just communicating with home health agencies that um, definitely protect uh, uh, protected health information. And so we are well aware, as I'm sure you all are, that um, HIPAA compliance is very important and we strive to maintain confidentiality um, above all. So I hope that that answers that question. Okay, well, thank you, um, Stacey, and appreciate that. It's, uh, like I said, you state it so much better than I do, but it's something that may help um, for those of you that aren't familiar with uh, where HHQI comes from. A home health quality improvement, we are HHQI, but we're employed by the Quality Improvement Organization or the Quality Innovation Network, as you've been hearing probably a lot about QUINs and QIOs, um, for the state of West Virginia, New Jersey, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. So we are part of the Quality Improvement Organization, and that information that you are transmitting, even though it is at the patient level, that stops there. It does not get reported out in any way, shape, or form. In fact, individual agency information doesn't get reported out to CMS. They, even if you're doing fantastic, we're not allowed to. 
So the level of protection doesn't just stop at the patient. Our HIPAA regulations are actually higher than normal PHI and HIPAA requirements. So um, even if you're doing fantastic, we would love to be bragging about you, but um, we are not allowed. We we do not transmit that further to CMS. So just to give you a little bit of hints on that. But keep the questions coming. I also saw one about um, hypertension and if calling the physician was um, adequate as a measure to count as hypertension intervention. And if it's okay, Misty, I was just gonna jump in and answer that one really fast because that's the one we get asked pretty frequently. And that is, the answer would be, it depends. And I know that's a really wishy-washy answer. But if your patient is for that episode of care was a therapy only episode of care, meaning there was no skilled nurse visit at all during that entire episode, a therapist contacting a physician's office about an elevated blood pressure is a yes and it's acceptable. But if that patient during that episode of care was seen by a skilled nurse in any way, shape or form, then that is not a therapy only patient and simply contacting the physician is a no. The reason being that the scope of practice between physical therapists and registered nurses, there is a fine line and this is one of them. So it is within the scope of practice of a therapist to simply contact the physician when it has to deal with hypertension, but it is expectations are greater for a registered nurse treating a patient with hypertension beyond just notifying a physician of an elevated pressure. And that would include an additional assessment that would include uh, just looking for hidden sources of sodium. Uh, there's also medication adherence, seeing if the patient's antihypertensive medications are being adhered to. Now, one last thing, and I'll get off this because I do want to leave time for other questions, but when you're looking for the documentation of your clinicians and they simply write med adherence completed or patient adhering to meds, that sounds really good. And that's super easy to chart, but unfortunately that would be a no for the hypertension intervention question because it has to be indicated that the medications that we're talking about were antihypertensive. Same things with med education. Now most EHRs do have a little box that you can check right next to the med. And so if they are on an ACE or an ARB or something for hypertension purposes, they can check that box and say that that's the medication education that the patient received this particular visit that's adequate and that's a yes. The patient's interventions were completed, but if it's a simple document in a note that says med ed completed, then that won't be acceptable. So uh, I think I beat that dead horse to death, but uh, let, keep the questions coming, please. And if we're not able to answer all of them here today, we will continue and we'll include all of the questions from today in our FAQs that we will be updating sometime in the next uh, four or five days. So before Thanksgiving, we'll have an updated FAQ list, which will include anything that comes in today that we're not able to answer while we're on uh, this call. All right, Misty, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, we did And actually, a Misty, I'm gonna go right. ahead and take one that's on the chat. So um, we have from Kathy, and she's asking about, could I repeat about QAPI? Um, the new proposed conditions of participation talks about creating a, uh, a quality improvement plan, a QAPI plan, uh, that will be a formalized structured plan. And you're allowed to do that on an outcome measure of your choice, that could be ACH, oral meds, um, anything that you want, but that is allowable on the cardiovascular registry as well, or, or cardiovascular health, sorry, not that, but you're using the registry to collect your data. That needs to be a formal process so that using some type of a, a quality improvement model. We're really encouraging, a lot of organizations have been very successful in using the, the, um, the IHI's uh, improvement model that includes using PDSA cycles, plan, study, do, uh, and act, plan, PDSA, yes, act. And so you want to be able to use data, you want to set up a formal plan, and that is what you're going to be required to do. Your surveyors are going to be looking at that. So the proposed rules do, do talk about that. It, if you read the preamble, it talks a lot about using or a good bit about 
setting up quality improvement plans and using resources that are already available, such as HHQI and using the cardiovascular data registry, looking at the underserved populations. And we have lots of resources that you can use, even if it isn't cardiovascular, but if you're interested, that's why you're on the call today then that could be a way that would be a nice tie-in to the work that you need to do. And I will share, I know we're almost at the end of the hour, but I, I, from from a National Association for Home Care, when uh, Mary Carr was presenting recently, her, I love what she said. She said, don't wait for the rule. We don't know how long it's going to take. There are numerous pieces, but the quality improvement is things that we should have been doing all along or that you were doing. It, right now, your QUINs or your QIOs are looking for home health agents to, to help work on this cardiovascular work. I would, would, the first thing I would do after I leave this call today, beyond making sure you've signed up for the cardiac LAN and start to think about um, how, which measures do we want to try and what we're going to do, but I'd also contact your QUIN or your QIO, talk to them, find out what it is that they might be able to help you. They're going to be able to help you set up a, a plan and help you with thinking about your steps with collecting your abstraction. Uh, Cindy showed you an abstraction tool. They're going to be able to look at your processes and try to help you find the best way within your organization. So and that, with that, I will turn that back over to you, Ms. D.D. I don't think we have any other questions waiting in the queue. Um, we have just one minute left. I could go ahead and open the phone lines for anybody who'd like to ask a question verbally. Medical director gets up and talks about how you use the So Lisa raises her hand and somebody raises their hand and he asked them first and they said, as of October the 1st, you can't use that anymore. I use it. Oh, good to talk. I thought, and you're presenting? This is Cindy Sun. I will just go ahead and say thank you to everyone for joining us today. We do appreciate your time. We understand that you have many obligations. We do want to uh, encourage you to join us again on December 18th. That is the third Thursday at 2 o'clock Eastern. All of those who have registered for the Cardio Land, you will receive the invitation. The invitations are unique for each person, so make sure that if you have other people at your agency that want to register and participate, please ask them to do so. Second thing, there's three things here. The second thing I'll remind you is to what Missy, uh, excuse me, Kevich was saying, contact your QIO. Let them know they are looking for work, people who want to work on cardiovascular care. You have quality improvement organizations, folks, these experts are in your state. If you're looking to see the exact person to contact, feel free to contact us at hhqi at wvmi.org and we'll be glad to get you in touch with the right person, or you can look at the network coordinator list, which is located on the website under the About Us tab and under Partners. So have a look at that. The third and final thing I will remind you is that after you finish the webinar today, you're going to be directed to an evaluation form. We really would encourage you to complete this and let us know what direction you want your call, your cardio LAN call, what direction would you like it to take? There's a comment box there at the end. You will have this option on um, every single meeting so that we can continue to help this meeting and this group evolve into what you, what will work best for you. So with that, we at HHQI would like to say thank you to everyone. We really do appreciate your time. And please don't hesitate to contact us with any other questions or if there's anything that we can help you with. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a great day. Okay. Okay.